Good evening. In the Catholic Book of Worship, number 435, 435, please stand. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters in Christ, and a very special greeting to the priests of the Diocese of Saskatoon. It is again very good to be here tonight. Uh, we celebrate the Chrism Mass. We celebrate the Mass that is about the uh, establishment, the birthday, if you will, of the ministerial priesthood. And it's so wonderful and appropriate to do that with all of you. 
because you share in the common priesthood of Jesus Christ and you support our priests and you call forth their priesthood in your lives uh, as the people of God. Uh, and as you receive from them, so you go forward to bring Christ to the world, to your families and many others. I do also want to acknowledge we have many catechumens and candidates who are getting ready to receive the full sacraments of initiation or in some cases confirmation uh, at the coming Easter vigil. And they are here with their parish representatives and a special welcome to you on this special time and journey as you prepare for this very powerful event in your life and in the, our lives together. So again, a <laughs> lot of reasons why it's very good to be here tonight. I do want to mention one more issue before we begin. Uh, three days ago, suddenly a priest of our diocese passed, Father Jean-Marc Moreau. And he was a priest for a long time of our diocese, and he died at St. Anne's residence. So we are celebrating his funeral tomorrow, as many of our priests are, are here from outside Saskatoon, and they're better able to attend. And so, uh, but it's also appropriate to hold him in prayer on this special night when we celebrate again the ministerial priesthood and thank God for Father Jean-Marc's priesthood. We begin, as always, opening our hearts to God. And we call to mind our constant need for his grace and mercy and also for his forgiveness of our sins and healing in our lives. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May the Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen.
God, who anointed your only begotten Son with the Holy Spirit and made him Christ and Lord, graciously grant that being made sharers in his consecration, we may bear witness to your redemption in the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, you shall be called priest of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsorial psalm is in CBW number 64, CBW 64. my firstborn 
the highest of the kings of the earth. I will keep my love for him always. With him my covenant shall last forever. Lecture de l'Apocalypse de Saint Jean. Que la grâce et la paix soient, soient données de la part de Jésus-Christ, le témoin fidèle, le premier-né d'entre les morts, le souverain des rois de la terre. À lui qui nous aime, qui nous a délivrés de nos péchés par son sang, qui a fait de nous le royaume et les prêtres de Dieu, son Père. À lui, gloire et puissance, pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. Voici qu'il vient parmi les nuées, et tous les hommes le verront, même ceux qui l'ont transpercé. Et en le voyant, toutes les tribus de la terre se le menteront. Oui, vraiment. Amen. Je suis l'Alpha et l'Oméga, dit le Seigneur Dieu. Je suis celui qui est, qui était et qui vient, le Tout-Puissant. Parole du Seigneur. With you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
and he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. May the words of the Gospel wipe away my sins. One of the few times I speak from the chair is uh, the Christmas, and there's a very practical reason. I can see my brothers a little easier than being, being forward there. So um, I, I think they appreciate that. I'm not sure, you know. Um, and I, again, I want to start my words tonight uh, just acknowledging the passing of Father John Mark Moreau. And uh, I, as a priest, you know, I had a, a limited experience of him in my last six years. Um, but, you know, when I reflected on the scriptures tonight, especially the first reading in the, in the gospel, I really thought of, of Father Jean-Marc because my experience of him, even in his old years, was that this particular passage really applies to him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort all who mourn and give them a garland instead of ashes, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. Now, Father Mark was a very energetic priest, and uh, even though he didn't look so in his latter years, he was responsible for the vocations to the priesthood of many and also uh, other vocations of faithfulness to Christ because of the spirit in which he lived his priesthood. Uh, actually, I've also experienced in Father John Mark the prophet Jeremiah, and this quote uh, catches my impression of him. Within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in. I cannot. And Father Jean-Marc certainly did not hold within the fire that the Holy Spirit gave him to bring to others in his priesthood. Brothers and sisters, we begin another Holy Week having experienced this past while the call to be light and to do so by enduring burning. And this has had particular ramifications for the experience of our priesthood by our clergy. However, the images of fire and flame, as you know, involve many features, including burning, enduring burning, and being consumed. Pope Francis, in his Lenten message of this year, entitled, Through the Desert, God Leads Us to Freedom, reflects on the journey through the desert from slavery to freedom. He states that the call to freedom is an intriguing but demanding one. It is not immediately answered nor apparent. It needs to mature, especially because God's people often cling, ironically, to the oppressive bondage that it is called to leave behind. This is a feature that affects everyone, all God's faithful, and it can affect us priests. And we have been consumed. The challenges, the tensions and conflicts, the polarizations that we have all experienced in our world, our country, our communities, our families, even in the church, have been very challenging and uncharacteristic of what we might have called a, a regular acceptable normal. In all of this, God's people look to his priests to be another Christ, who bring light and hope amidst all of this. Of course, 
God's people look to one another, as all are called, to bring Christ to the world by being images and reflections of what they receive in prayer, word, and sacrament. And may I say, Father Jean-Marc was a man and a priest who was a light for others, and his life featured also burning, being consumed for others. Tonight, I wish to reflect on two key features, mercy and hope. Mercy has also been, as you know, a key theme for Pope Francis. Many theologians are arguing mercy is the central theme, and furthermore, a key message of the Pope to the clergy of today's world. When we reflect on the key Pauline text, which begins Holy Week, Philippians 2, 6 to 11, as we did on Passion Sunday, we receive a theological summary called the kenosis of Jesus Christ, which means the voluntary divestment of his divine powers and his absolute self-emptying. Firstly, he was in the form of God. He, He was God. Secondly, he did not regard his equality with God as something to be exploited or taken advantage of. Thirdly, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Who has ever done this? Especially when they had the unique ability to overcome or at least avoid. Fourthly, he became obedient all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross, a scandalous, painful way to die. This is absurd. No one, let alone with such status and ability, has ever done this. Finally, this is why God exalted him. And this is why every knee should bend, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Pope Francis, a few years ago on this theme, stated... There are many people who admire Jesus. He he said beautiful things. He, He was filled with love and forgiveness. His example changed history and so on. They admire him, but their lives are not changed. To admire Jesus is not enough. We have to follow in his footsteps to let ourselves be challenged by him, to pass from mere Uh, mere admiration to amazement. What is most amazing about the Lord and his Passover, it's the fact that he achieves glory through humiliation. He triumphs by accepting suffering and death, things that we, in our quest for admiration and success, would avoid. Jesus did it for us to plumb the depths of our human experience our entire existence, all are evil. The Pope concluded that the celebration of the passion of our Lord needs to move us from distant admiration to amazement at Jesus, who demonstrates the greatest love the world has known on the cross. Our salvation and new life passes through the wood of the cross. And because of this greatest love the world has known, we can now say, when we face the sun, all shadows will be behind us. A few reflections on the imperative of mercy in Jesus Christ. I find increasingly theologians of of all stripes, so to speak, facing the increasingly bizarre and concerning state of affairs of our current world, and looking for the primary features and imperatives of the gospel are focusing on one key theme, the imperative of mercy, especially divine mercy. As one theologian states in her recent reflections on Pope Francis and mercy, titled A Dynamic Theological Hermeneutic, uh, yeah, big phrase, quote, the central dynamic of Pope Francis' pontificate from the very first days is the proclamation of the importance of the mercy of God, a mercy that imperatively calls for a human response and imitation. The Holy Father states, let us abandon a language of condemnation and embrace one of mercy, 
We receive the mercy of God to adopt this attitude toward others. The work of mercy is a visceral love that brings knowledge of the goodness and kindness of God to all. Mercy is the Lord's most powerful message. Mercy is not one divine attribute among many, but the central lens through which we may glimpse at the love of God. The theologian goes on to situate the focus of mercy. What has come to be known and appreciated as the greatest feature of Pope Francis's pontificate was not a sudden eruption in time. It is important to have a sense of where Pope Francis drew on his predecessors for inspiration. Pope Benedict XVI prepared the way for Francis, both theologically and through his noble humility and courage in resigning, thereafter voluntarily placing upon himself a vow of prayer and silence. There is a certain theological continuity that is most clearly expressed by the fact that Pope Francis, with only two short editions, adopted as his own encyclical Lumen Fide that had been written by Pope Benedict before he left office. We know that Pope Francis often spoke with Pope Benedict. Thus, it is no wonder that Pope Francis stated in his apostolic letter issued at the conclusion of the extraordinary jubilee of mercy, November 20th, 2016, God's love must take primacy over all else. So what can we say about the features of mercy as a response to our current affairs? A few brief reflections. Mercy is not soft, but it is tender, sensitive, and compassionate. It knows how to forgive. Mercy does not turn a blind eye to the great challenges before us, but faces these challenges with conviction and a commitment to hope. Mercy may seem to be subtle, but boy is it potent. Mercy teaches humility while also engendering strength of character, a character that has at its object the mind and heart of Christ. And in this, it has the ability to endure hardship, even tragedy, and also to pers persevere in humility when things seem to go well, or they go well. Mercy is not toxic compassion, but it has as its source divine mercy from the sacred heart of Jesus Christ, which pours out to redeem not a few, but the many desiring the all. Mercy faces many obstacles, problems, sins, does not avoid nor forget, but in admitting and remembering brings awareness, penance, forgiveness, learning and healing, and a renewed future. Pope Francis has stated about the unique and radical example of Jesus Christ that is most evident as we celebrate Holy Week and the Easter Twitterum. I quote, there are many people who admire Jesus. He said beautiful things. He was filled with love and forgiveness. His example changed history and so on. As I said earlier, they admire him, but their lives are not changed. The Pope concludes that the celebration of the passion of our Lord needs again to move us from distant admiration to amazement. The greatest love the world has known on the cross is Christ. Our salvation and new life passes again through the wood of the cross. And now a brief reflection on the imperative of hope alongside of mercy. A key feature, brothers, of our amazement, which calls us more deeply into the mercy of Jesus Christ, connects us to what might be the most urgent and difficult theological issue for our church and world today. This is the virtue of hope. Brothers, we have chosen a life and a vocation, or better, God has chosen us, to a way that involves our being effective in a vocation, which by its very nature must decrease 
so that he will increase. Our life as priests is given away for others so that, as the prophet Isaiah says, the oppressed, the brokenhearted, the captives, the prisoners, those who mourn will find healing, blessing, and renewal in the Lord. The moment we, I, become the focus and reason of our effectiveness and excellence, we are no different from the world. And especially when the best of what we do is not being matched by any seeming corresponding improvement in the world around us. We are a blessing for the world when we die to ourselves a little bit every day as we surrender a worldview, a self-view, as successful priests and bishops. This can happen in many ways in our ministry, uh, pardon me, in our ministry. For example, the third munera, the ministry of service and leadership, cannot overwhelm or overshadow the first and second. The ministries of sacrament, of preaching and speaking his word, of pastoral care, must always be a central feature of our priesthood. In fact, orienting the expression of our leadership and service and determining and affecting our administrative priorities. A brief reflection on the way of the mystic and celibacy as an expression of hope. Uh, You may remember several chrism mass homilies ago, I spoke to you about how the priest is called to the life of the mystic, which helps us to encounter God so that as we deal with all sorts of challenges and difficult issues, and of course the opportunities and privileges of priestly fatherhood, we will not be consumed, but rather become more and more the brilliant, beautiful, healthy men of God that we are called and destined to be. This is the lesson from the book of Exodus. Moses meets God in the burning bush that is not consumed by the fire, but rather is made more lively and luminescent because of the presence of God. Or a lesson we behold in the life of Saint Joseph, who could have been utterly devastated and overwhelmed by fear at the threat to his family, but is able to receive and respond to God's message brought to him in dreams which represent his own mystical union with God in his life and vocation of fatherhood. The call to be mystics is also the means by which we are a priest of God for others and can live and embrace celibacy in our priesthood. As you know, there is lots to reflect on this issue. I quote one well-known theologian from several decades ago as he states, quote, Nevertheless, the harshness of life and its grandeur will not let us dabble committing ourselves, will not let us dabble committing ourselves only until further notice. Every choice is a decision about an unpredictable future. Is celibacy a legalistic, coercive institution because once freely accepted, it also becomes a moral obligation as long as one wishes to remain in the Latin priesthood? Then marriage as Christians, as Christians understand it, once freely accepted, also becomes a coercive institution compared with the pure, spontaneous miracle of personal love. No, taking paths along which one can never retrace one's steps, is part of the texture of life and the splendid miracle of enthusiastic, uncovenanted freedom reaches to its own fulfillment only in the sober guise of duty, faithfulness, and endurance until the end. What can shed light on my celibacy? Only communing with God himself only imploring God's grace, only a prayerful struggle to accept the folly and the scandal of the gospel over and over again. Wondering if you might guess who that was? That's Karl Rahner, one of the early fathers of the Second Vatican Council. Brothers, let us celebrate and be open to the lives that we are living and leading as priests. The grass is not greener in another place or assignment, 
as many pre-saints have shown who have gone before us, God's grace and blessing work powerfully and wonderfully when we have gratitude and an act of generosity through our priesthood. Such gratitude and generosity is lived and expressed most vividly in a way of priestly life where we are uncertain of our immediate future and in a climate where doubt and anxiety are commonplace. This has always been the case as we deal with the tension between the journey through the wilderness desert and the call to freedom. As Pope Francis recently reflected, when our God reveals himself, his message is always one of freedom. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, one of the house of slavery. The call to freedom is a demanding one. It is not answered straight away. It has to mature as part of the journey. Just as Israel in the desert still clung to Egypt, often longing for the past and grumbling against the Lord and Moses, today too God's people can cling to an oppressive bondage that it is called to leave behind. We realize how true this is at those moments when we feel hopeless, wandering, wandering through life like a desert and lacking a promised land as our destination. But God shapes his people. He enables us to leave our slavery behind and experience a Passover from death to life. Like a bridegroom, the Lord draws us once more to himself, whispering words of love to our hearts. A few more words from Pope Francis. In the Exodus account, there is a significant detail. It is God who sees and brings freedom. Israel does not ask for this. Pharaoh, Pharaoh stifles dreams, blocks the view of heaven, makes it appear that this world in which human dignity is trampled upon and authentic bonds are denied can never change. Let us be aware of the temptation to settle for something less just because it is common and familiar. Again from Francis, let us ask, do I want a new world? Am I ready to leave behind my compromises with the old? The witnesses of many of my brother bishops and a great number of those who work for peace and justice has increasingly convinced me that we need to combat a deficit of hope that stifles dreams and the silent cry that reaches to the heavens and moves the heart of God. This deficit of hope is not unlike the nostalgia for slavery that paralyzed Israel in the desert and prevented it from moving forward. Pope Francis concludes, to the extent that this Lent becomes a time of conversion, an anxious humanity will notice a burst of creativity, a flash of new hope. To the extent that our priesthood is a time of conversion, then our lives for others will be an encounter of hope for others. May this coming Easter Triduum be a time of grace and renewal. We may still struggle with suffering, pain, disillusionment, and uncertainty, either in our own lives or in terms of what we experience in our world. And boy, we know this. But let us respond with a renewed hope and conviction that our lives are really being guided and held by the salvific hand of the God who saves. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, for by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
you can, we'll get you up in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> Beloved brothers, sons, on the anniversary of that day, when Christ our Lord conferred his priesthood on his apostles and on us, are you resolved to renew in the presence of your bishop and God's holy people the promises you once made? Are you resolved to be more united with the Lord Jesus and more closely conformed to him, denying yourselves and confirming those promises about sacred duties towards Christ's church, which, prompted by love of him, you willingly and joyfully pledged on the day of your priestly ordination? Are you resolved to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God, in the Holy Eucharist and the other liturgical rites, and to discharge faithfully the sacred office of teaching, following Christ the head and shepherd, not seeking any gain, but moved only by the zeal for souls. I am. I turn toward you and invite you to please stand, uh, people of God. And I invite you to please respond, Christ hear us, Christ graciously hear us. As for you, dearest sons and daughters, pray for your priests, that the Lord may pour out his gifts abundantly upon them and keep them faithful as ministers of Christ, the high priest, so that they may lead you to him who is the source of salvation. Christ Christ hear us, Christ Christ graciously hear us. Pray also for me that I may be faithful to the apostolic office entrusted to me in my lowliness, and that in your midst I may be made day by day a living and more perfect image of Christ, the priest, the good shepherd, the teacher and servant of all. Christ, Christ hear us, graciously hear, us. hear, us. hear, us. hear us. May the Lord keep us all in his charity and lead all of us, shepherds and flock, to eternal life. Amen. In the Catholic Book of Worship, number 65, number 65 in the Catholic Book of Worship. Thank you. 
of the sick. Lord God, loving Father, you bring healing to the sick through this, your Son, Jesus Christ. Hear us as we pray to you in faith and send the Holy Spirit, our helper and friend, upon this oil, which nature has provided to serve the needs of all your people. May your blessing come upon all who are anointed with this oil, that they may be freed from pain and illness and made well again in body, mind, and soul. Father, may this oil be blessed for our use in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The oil of the catechumens. Lord God, protector of all who believe in you, bless this oil and give wisdom and strength to all who are anointed with it in preparation for their baptism. Bring them to a deeper understanding of the gospel. Help them to accept the challenge of Christian living and lead them to the joy of new birth in the family of your church. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Joy Christman. Let us now pray that God, our Almighty Father, will bless this oil so that all who are anointed with it may be inwardly transformed and come to share in eternal salvation. God, our Maker, source of all growth and holiness, accept the joyful thanks and praise we offer in your name of the church. In the beginning, at your command, the earth produced fruit-bearing trees, from the fruit of the olive tree you have provided us with oil for holy chrism. The prophet David sang of the life and joy that the oil would bring us in the sacraments of your love. After the avenging flood, the dove returned to Noah with an olive branch, announced your gift of peace. This was a sign of a greater gift to come. Now the waters of baptism wash away the sins of men. And by the anointing with olive oil, you make us radiant with your joy. At your command, Aaron was washed with water, and your servant Moses, his brother, anointed him priest. This too foreshadowed greater things to come. After your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, asked John for baptism in the waters of the Jordan, you sent the Spirit upon him in the form of a dove. And by the witness of your own voice, you declared him to be your only well-beloved son. In this you clearly fulfilled the prophecy of David, that Christ would be anointed with the oil of gladness beyond his fellow men. And so, Father, we ask you to bless this oil that you have created. Fill it with the power of your Holy Spirit through Christ your Son. It is from him that chrism takes its name. And with chrism you have anointed for yourself priests and kings, prophets and martyrs. Make this chrism a sign of life and salvation for those who are to be born again in the waters of baptism. Wash away the evil they have inherited from sinful Adam. When they are anointed with this holy oil, make them temples of your glory, radiant with the goodness of life that has its source in you. Through this sign of chrism, grant them royal, priestly, and prophetic honor, and clothe them with incorruption. Let this be indeed the chrism of salvation for those who will be born again of water and the Holy Spirit. May they come to share eternal life in the glory of your kingdom. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Catholic Book of Worship, number 430. 430. 
brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all his holy church. May the power of this sacrifice, O Lord, we pray, mercifully wipe away what is old in us and increase in us grace of salvation and newness of life through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son, High Priest of the new and eternal covenant, and by your wondrous design, we're pleased to decree that his one priesthood should continue on your church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he has made his own, but with a brother's kindness, he chooses men to become sharers in his sacred mystery through the laying on of his hands. They are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the paschal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word and strengthen them with the sacraments 
as they give up their lives for you, for the salvation of their brothers and sisters. They strive to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks, as in exaltation we acclaim. Therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. <coughs> Remember your servants, and all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, mother of our, of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, and Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogenus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damien, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of your service, that of your whole family, Order our days in your peace and command that we may be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you.
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servant Jean-Marc and Bernard, priests of God, who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. To us also, your servants, who do sinners, hope in your abundant mercy, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with St. John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Mussolinius, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them and fill them with life, bless them and bestow them upon us. Through him, with him, in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant us peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace of Christ be with you. takes away the sins of the world. Blessed those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
In the glory and praise, number 557. Number 557.
Let us conclude our prayer. Let us pray. We beseech you, Almighty God, that those you renew by your sacraments may merit to become the pleasing fragrance of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Just two brief words. One, uh, just to thank you all for being here and uh, just to express to uh, the brother priests of the diocese, uh, it's very good to celebrate uh, this Chrism Mass with you and to ask God's continued blessing on your priesthood. And, uh, and I take this opportunity to thank you for your support in many ways to me. Uh, uh, I feel it very strongly and I thank you for that. And um, finally, I, an invitation to all of you immediately following, we have a lot of food, okay? So we really need you to come and share in this food. And you're very welcome to uh, celebrate this as we get ready for the Easter Triduum and blessings on your Holy Week and getting ready for this powerful time of our faith. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty be with you always, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our celebration is ended. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the Catholic Book of Worship, number 691, 691.